it is a pleasure to welcome Mark, who will talk about fluor cohomology and arc spaces. Okay, great. So, yes, so this, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to start by introducing fluor cohomology just as, a, as an idea. And then after that, I'll talk about arc spaces, what they are. Um, but maybe I should just do sort of a small, I, I should do some motivation. Um, so th th this is a sort of, yeah, so this is a motivation. So, so flow cohomology is a kind of very useful tool in symplectic geometry and also in other areas of geometry, you know, solving many sort of dynamical problems and geometric problems in symplectic geometry and, and also in other areas of geometry as well. Like you know, three manifold and four manifold theory and so on. But the, the flow cohomology groups I'm interested in are the ones that, you know, um, that solve symplectic problems. And so uh, it's uh, very useful to understand what these groups are. Um, so I'm interested in computing them. Um, and so, so I want to compute them for various, say, symplectic manifolds or other objects in geometry, and I want some tools to, to do that. Um, um, yeah. However, these hard groups are extremely hard to compute if you just look at the definition, but uh, that's true for many cohomology, you know, usual normal cohomology groups as well. You know, never really use the definition directly. Um, but, but these are even harder to compute than say, I don't know, singular cohomology or something because there's no, I mean, it, it, there's, there's no, the, 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 there is, there's no real sort of mayor veteris kind of axiom or something like that. Um, I mean, there sort of is in some cases, but, but generally not. So they're usually quite hard to compute. Um, um, so the talk is based on an observation by Paul Seidel about 20 years ago. And he said um, the following thing. So the, he said the arc space has some similarities with flow cohomology. And I'll explain this later in the talk. So um, um, I'll give a very sort of rough definition of the arc space right now, which is, is just the space of holomorphic maps mapping to a, some sort of variety, some sort of complex space defined as the zero set of some polynomials. And um, it's just the space of disks, you know, equipped with, um, but for me, the C infinity topology or compact open topology or something would suffice for, for me. And um, here's the, the sort of general goal of my talk is to sort of realize this observation. Um, so I want to understand this observation of all, to understand this better this relationship between Fleur theory and arc spaces. And you know, the hope is to compute these Fleur groups so that I can apply it to symplectic geometry. And I have a special advertising spiel just for algebraic geometers, which is uh, you too can prove results in symplectic geometry <laughs> without doing much symplectic geometry. So that's the, so, so you should be able to, I, I, my hope is that an algebraic geometer can come along and prove, compute Fleur groups without doing any Fleur theory. So that's, the, that's my sort of, uh, way of attracting people to this talk. Okay. Great. So what I want to do first is talk about Fleur theory and I want to talk about um, Morse homology. So um, there's, some of you have come across it, but some of you haven't. So I'm gonna talk about that first because I think that's very important and um, so 
one way of thinking about Moss homology is is the following. So, 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 so one way I like to think about it is um, you start with some sort of statue or something. So here's a statue. I think it's in Chicago. And you imagine um, it's raining in Chicago. And, um, and then it's a bit harder to imagine, but you imagine there's no wind there. <laughs> and the, the, the rain, you know, the rain's coming down and the, the raindrops hit this statue and they, um, you know, what, what happens is the water sort of sticks to the statue and it runs down sort of vertically. And then, um, you know, at, at sort of points where the statue is level, you know, the drop either stays where it is or it sort of drops out the bottom. So, so, you, so what you have is you have sort of points, a, a bunch of points where the, the raindrops are sort of stationary and then the rest of the time it's flowing sort of between these, these stationary points. So what I'm going to do is, well, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume the statue's upside down so it looks like that. And, um, and I'm going to do more homology for, for this example. So you're going to be talking about flow lines of, of the of the of the decreasing uh, function or the height function, but um, you want to imagine that the rain, once it touches this uh, the statue, cannot leave it until it gets to the very bottom, right? It's not it. Right. Yeah. 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 Unlike the yeah. rain that would just uh, start dropping off when it got to a place when it was uh, too had passed uh, uh, being completely having a vertical tangent space. Yes, exactly. Bottom so side. I'm going to explain that. Yeah, I'm, 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 just, I'm going to talk about that right now. <laughs> so this is this is just my sort of silly <laughs> illustration. OK, so, so the functions I'm interested in are Morse functions. So I have a smooth manifold M. And it's called a Morse function if, if, it, if, it, if near each critical point, so each point where the derivative of f vanishes, there is some local coordinate chart with coordinates x1 to xn, so that f looks like, looks like this. It looks like a quadratic function with um, k negative eigenvalues. Um, and k is called the index of the critical point. And so, so, e, so, so for instance, k could be 0, and then it's a sort of minimum and if k is n, it's a maximum. And if it's in between, then you, know, you get other sort of saddle points. So that's what a Morse function is. It's, the, it's a function which near the critical points looks quadratic, or equivalently, if the Hessian is non-degenerate. Uh, non and then you can prove it has this form with respect to some coordinate chart around each critical point. So these functions are generic. So you know, I can always find any, for any smooth function, I can find some other function nearby, which is Morse. Yeah, K is called the Morse index of the critical point. So, um, so there's a bunch of critical points. They have different Morse indices. And Morse index zero is a minimum. Morse index N is a maximum. And here's my, uh, well, it's, it's a little bit different to the, that Chicago statue, but this is my statue. So my Morse function is the height function, as Claude was saying. And, um, and um, so, 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 so I have my manifold, it's a sphere. I've embedded the sphere in R3, and my Morse function is the height function. And then I can look at the critical points. I have one of index 0, one of index 1, and two of index 2. Okay. So this is the example you should just keep in mind as we go through this first part of the talk. So each Morse function gives rise to a cell decomposition of my manifold. And um, I'm and, and the way you, the way you understand this is you look at sub-level sets of the Morse function. So the set of points below some level set of the function. So here's, a, here's how it looks like for my example. So first of all, I look at a very small 
sublevel set, which is a, a small neighborhood of the minimum of the Morse function. And that's homotopic to a zero cell. So that's, that corresponds to a zero cell. So the most critical points of index zero corresponds to zero cells. And then I take a slightly higher level set and I get, um, uh, uh, I, I go just above the, 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 the critical point of index one and I look at the sub-level set there. And now, 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 I, now this sub-level set is a zero cell with a one cell attached. So, so you can see this picture at deformation retracts onto um, this gray circle that I've drawn, and that's a zero cell union for one cell. So when I attach handles of index one, they when, when I have most critical points of index one, that corresponds to attaching one cells. And then um, I go higher again, and now I attach two two cells. So if I have more index, if I have critical points of index two, then that corresponds to attaching two cells. So, so Morse functions give you very nice cellular decompositions of your manifold. So you can think of your manifold as a CW complex using the Morse function. Okay. So I'll just do the animation again. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, so, so if you have a cell, cell decomposition of a topological space, then you can look at cellular homology. You know, cellular homology is, you know, you have one generator of your chain complex for each cell, and then the attaching map, so, so that, that gives you a, uh, uh, some, some say, um, that Arbelian group freely generated by the cells, and then you have a differential, which is a matrix with respect to this basis of cells. And the, um, the, the attaching maps of each cell give you, sort of tell you what the coefficients are in that, that matrix. So um, here, so, so what we want to do is translate this into the world of Morse functions. <coughs> so what I want to do is look at cellular homology from the perspective of Morse functions. So, so for, for Morse homology of a, so when I define Morse homology of a, 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 a Morse function, uh, I want to construct a, a chain complex. And as, a, as, a, as an Arbelian group, it's just the free Arbelian group generated by the critical points, which I've labeled P1 to PK. So those are the, so those are the critical points of my, um, so I have K critical points. So I just have the free Arbelian group of rank K. And this Arbelian group is graded. Um, it's a graded Arbelian group um, and it's graded by the Morse index. And then I need to compute what the differential is. So again, with cellular homology, the differential is some sort of degree, um, but, but the differential in Morse homology so, 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 so the way to compute the differential in Morse homology is to, is to, 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 in fact, to look at flow lines between critical points. So we want gradient flow lines. So it's in order to compute. So remember this sort of raining example, when you have the raindrops hitting your manifold, they go down, they sort of go down this statue. And those are the gradient flow lines. Um, and so you, so in general, you choose a Riemannian metric. It's some generic, some generic Riemannian metric. Oops, oops, sorry. Um, it's some generic Riemannian metric. And then the differential is a matrix with respect to this basis of critical points. And so if you have two critical points um, and their index difference is one, you want to compute the PI, PJ element 
of this matrix. And that's the number of gradient flow lines connecting PI and PJ. And it's counted with respect to some sign. Um, and I'm not going to explain what that sign is, um, but you do, you do some sort of orientation kind of, you know, there's some sort of calculation involved there. Um, if, if you're, for the moment, because we're not worrying about, I didn't explain orientation, you could assume Z is some other ring, like Z over 2Z. And then um, there's no sign in Z over 2Z, so you don't have to count these with sign. So, so this is the sort of description of Morse homology, and it sort of mirrors, it, it's essentially um, how you would um, compute cellular homology using this, this sort of decomposition that I described um, earlier. Okay. So let me do this example. So here's, here's my example. I have four critical points on this sphere. And I've labeled them A, B, C, and D. And then uh, here's my chain complex. It's the free abelian group generated by A, B, C, and D. And it's graded by the index. So I have one critical point of index zero. So I have the free abelian group generated by A. And then in degree one, I have the free abelian group generated by B. And in degree two, I have the free abelian group generated by two critical points, C and D. And then um, you can see these red lines I've drawn in this picture. Those are the gradient flow lines. And those gradient flow lines uh, com compute for me the, the, the entries of the, the matrix, which defines my differential. So here's my... Here's, here, here's the calculation. So, well, the boundary of A is zero because A is degree zero and C minus one is, F is zero. So um, C minus one and C three, C four, C five, et cetera, are zero. So the boundary of A is zero. And the boundary of B, well, there's two flow lines going from B to A. Um, however, they're counted with opposite sign. So they cancel each other out. Um, and again, I'm not going to explain signs. So again, if you're not worried, I mean, for the purposes of this talk, you know, you could replace Z with Z over 2Z. I and mean, then A plus A is A minus A is zero. And then um, there's one flow line from C to B. So the boundary of C is B. And one flow line from D to B. And the boundary of D is B. And again, um, this, this is exactly the chain complex you would get if you computed cellular homology of this sphere using the cellular decomposition that I sort of animated earlier. Okay, so that's my um, sort of quick summary of, of Morse homology. Okay, so what I, I I'm 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 interested in Fleur homology, which is an infinite dimensional sort of version of Morse homology. And um, so so now I have to be a little bit more vague. Oh yeah, sorry. So the answer, obviously, the answer is the homology of these two sphere. Um, Okay, so Fleur cohomology is an infinite dimensional version of Morse homology. Um, but it's a particular infinite dimensional version. So, so there, there have been in sort of infinite dimensional versions of, of Morse homology going a long way back before Fleur, such as, so, so for instance, you can, do, um, you can do Morse homology on the, the free loop space of a manifold. Um, with respect to, um, say, the energy functional. And um, that behaves much in the same way as, as, as the sort of Morse homology that I was computing above. But flow homology is a different kind of infinite dimensional Morse homology. So, so um, one thing 
that's important with, with flow cohomology is that the critical points have infinite index. So you have some sort of uh, function or functional on some sort of infinite dimensional manifold. And when you formally compute, say, the, the, um, the, the, the Morse index, um, you, you find that, that it's infinite. Um, so I, and, but, 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 the, but, 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 but in some sense, the, the difference in indices between two critical points is, is finite. So um, that's what saves us. So um, the fact that, that, that this index difference is finite. Um, so, so that's why it's, sometimes people call it half infinite dimensional homology because you know, the, 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 the index difference is finite between the, the two things, two critical points. Um, so, so there are many different kinds of flow cohomology groups um, with many different kinds of infinite dimensional sort of Morse functions. And um, so for instance, um, um, the first one I was introduced to was, uh, uh, the Chern Simons action functional. Um, I, I, I mean, I wasn't formally introduced to it, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it, this is this is one way. You know, if you do things sort of right, you, you get you get some sort of homology group. Um, but I'm interested in um, flow groups associated to symplectic geometry. So I, I want to describe uh, a flow group. Um, associated to a symplectic manifold. Okay, so here's the setup. So I'm gonna start with a smooth manifold and I'm gonna have a, the data is a one form so that um, D of that one form is non-degenerate. In other words, M, with D theta is a symplectic manifold. It's called an exact symplectic manifold. Um, M also needs to satisfy some other technical conditions, but we're going to sweep those under the rug for the purposes of this colloquium. And now, the other piece of data I want is an exact symplectomorphism. So what's that? So that's just a diffeomorphism so that if I pull back theta, then um, the pullback of theta minus theta is an exact one form. So it's equal to df for some function f. Okay, so this is the data I'm going to start with. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, construct. Oh, yes. Why is that an exact diffeomorphism? Uh, I, I don't know. What's the difference between an exact diffeomorphism and an exact symplectomorphism? Because it has the word symplectomorphism in it. Oh. Yeah, well, because it, it is a symplectomorphism. It's just a special kind of symplectomorphism, which There's is an exact, exact form that's involved, right? What would what, what you mean yeah. in the diffeomorphism context? So I suppose an exact diffeomorphism is, this is the, I presume Dennis is saying this is the definition of an exact diffeomorphism. P star theta minus theta is exact. So it pulls back d theta, but is that what you're saying? Yeah, so if you pull back d theta, you get d theta. So okay. it's a special okay. kind of symplectomorphism. Okay. So symplectomorphisms are diffeomorphisms preserving d theta, but then there are special kinds of symplectomorphisms which are exact. Um, Thank you. I guess for, for uh, volume pre preserving uh, diffeomorphisms, you could play this sort of game in dimension n minus one, but it, pro it probably doesn't go anywhere. 
Right. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's a bit, all I know is in this world, it's a bit richer than, than that yeah. story. Yeah. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna do, so to, to construct my FLIR cohomology group, I want to, first of all, construct the mapping torus of phi. So this is the, the, de the, the definition but I've got a picture as well. So, so you can look at the picture. Here's my picture. This blob is M. I take interval cross M and I glue the ends of integral cross M, interval cross M using the diffeomorphism phi. So that's my mapping torus. And I suppose, yeah. So, so this, is, this is what this equivalence relation is. If I, you know, this arrow is telling me what this equivalence relation is here. Okay, so this is the mapping torus. And now what I want to do is, well, as I said, FLIR homology is, is um, you know, some sort of Morse homology on an infinite dimensional manifold. So I want to construct my infinite dimensional manifold. So my infinite dimensional manifold is the following. Oh no, sorry, I've got one more, one more um, sorry, definition. So I, if you have the, the mapping torus, this also has a natural map to the circle. And here's again, here's my picture. Here's my mapping torus, and I have interval cross m. I map to the interval with the ends identified, and the interval with the ends identified is the circle. So, so, so the mapping torus is a vibration over the circle and sort of the monodromy around the vibration is phi, the, the diffeomorphism phi. And it, you know, it, ha it also has some other nice things. It has a natural sort of a flat connection coming, coming from this product structure, which is also very handy, will be handy for us as well. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, we need an infinite dimensional manifold. So the infinite dimensional manifold, oh, oh, I, sorry, I keep forgetting some data. So the, another piece of data is some one form on this mapping torus. Um, and this one form, I just choose any one form on this mapping torus whose restriction to each fiber of this natural map is equal to theta plus df, where f is some function. And this f can sort of vary as the fiber varies. Okay, so I could think of theta tilde as, I don't know, some kind of lift of theta or something like that. Something like that. Uh, so at the, uh, at the ends where you've glued, um, the theta is not actually sent to the theta on, theta at the zero end is not sent to theta, the, the one end, it's changed by adding a, a, an exact one form, right? Because- Right, so that's why, that's why this theta tilde is equal to theta plus an exact one form on each fiber. So, you know, if you want to construct this theta tilde, you, you know, you could do you something like- mean, I see, got it. Yeah, you sort of interpolate. Yeah. Okay, great. So now I can construct my infinite dimensional manifold. So my infinite dimensional manifold, which um, I'm gonna do Morse theory on, is just the space of sections of this mapping torus. Um, so uh, so you, when you put on in this, uh, this one form on the mapping torus and take D of it, then you get a two form, which is of maximal rank and it has a one dimensional kernel. So there's a different flow associated with it. It's not the original horizontal. Not the original flow, flow. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm more interested in the original flow just for the purposes of this talk. Yeah. Um, right. Um, if you're a homotopy theorist, you might recognize this space as the homotopy fixed point set of phi. 
Okay, and now I need to define the, the Morse function on this infinite dimensional manifold. And it's just the integral of this one form I constructed. Okay, so, so in summary, I have my symplectomorphism phi. I construct a mapping torus. I put a one form on this mapping torus. And my, my, my manifold is the space of sections of this mapping torus. And the Morse function is the integral of this one form. Of the section. Of the section, right. Uh -huh. mm. So if you map phi is identity, you get just the loop space. Yes. And otherwise, it's a kind of twisted loop space. So the, the critical points of it's this. It's called free loop space. The free yes, loop space. Yes, it's the free loop space. So the critical points are the, the constant sections of this mapping torus, where by constant, I mean the following thing. I mean, you know, the mapping torus is interval cross M quotiented by some equivalence relation. And the, the critical point, the a section is constant if its image is interval cross point. So, um, so remember the mapping torus is a product quotiented by an equivalence relation and it's constant with respect to this product structure. So equivalently, that's the same as the fixed points of the, the critical points correspond to the fixed points of this diffeomorphism. Okay, so now I do um, Morse homology for this, for this, um, this, 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 this setup. Okay, so the chain complex for Fleur cohomology, so if I mimic what you do for, for, for Morse homology, the, the chain complex for Fleur cohomology is just the free abelian group generated by the constant sections. Or equivalently, it's generated by the fixed points of the and that, Oh, sorry, one second. I think my headphones ran out of batteries, but I have spare headphones. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Let's carry on. Okay. So the differential is a matrix with respect to this basis of constant sections, and it's supposed to count flow lines with respect to some metric. Um, what, okay, so what I'm gonna do is just explain what the flow lines are. Um, so if I have two constant sections, L0 and L1, then I want to understand what the matrix entry of my differential corresponding to L0 and L1 is. And it's a count of some holomorphic sections of R cross M phi with respect to some appropriate almost complex structure, which I'm not going to define here. And the, these holomorphic sections they're, they're sections of some non-compact manifold with a non-compact base, and they asymptotically converge to L0 and L1. So, so maybe I should just show you the picture. So this is my picture of what's going on. Um, it's not, as I, as I said, these flow groups are re really you know, hard to compute. So it's it's sort of important 
for, for the purposes of this talk, it's not too important what the differential is, but I should try and picture what's going on anyway. So I have R cross the mapping torus. Remember these blobs represent M, my manifold M. Then I have M cross interval and the ends of this M cross interval are identified. That's what these red arrows symbolize. And that's my mapping torus. And I cross with R, which is going in this direction here. And I'm counting sections of this, this bundle. The base is R cross S1. I choose some appropriate, almost complex structure. I look at holomorphic sections that are asymptotic to L0 and L1. So I'm solving some sort of you know, Cauchy-Riemann equation with asymptotic boundary conditions. Uh, is that oh, Dennis, I think you muted yourself. It's, asympt it's asymptotic in which direction in the picture? Uh, the R direction. So as uh, so R, you know, there's some variable like S for R, and as S goes to minus infinity, you go to L zero, and as S goes to plus infinity, you go to L one. Oh, okay. So in, in this in this picture, the uh, the R is is horizontal left to right, and the the S ones are are drawn as little line segments on the. Yes, exactly. So the horizontal lines are the R direction, and these sort of diagonal lines are like the S one direction. Okay, so so that's that's the. That's flow cohomology of a symplectomorphism. And I, I hope it gives you a little flavor of what flow cohomology might look like. Yeah, so so, the, so the, the, the almost complex structure you're using is just any almost, a generic almost complex structure that's compatible with the symplectic structure of this product. So the- Yes, basically. Yeah. So you choose it so that the map is, the projection map to R cross S1 is holomorphic and it's translation invariant, and the restriction to each fiber is compatible with the, the symplectic structure. Um, yeah, and then you get a flow group, HF star phi, which is the resulting flow group. So I have an invariant associated to each symplectomorphism. Okay, so now I want to talk about so what I want to do is I want to understand the relationship between arc spaces and flow cohomology. Um, so, okay, my brain. Okay, so the so so what I want to do is explain this in a particular example, which is the um, the I'm going to compute flow groups associated to hypersurface singularities. So I'll explain what this means. So I'm going to, in particular, I'm going to compute the flow group of a Milner monodromy map. So I have, I start with some polynomial with an isolated singularity at zero. And I take a small sphere around this singularity. And then I look at the Milner map, which is just the argument of F restricted to this sphere away from where the argument is ill-defined. And this is a fibration. The Milner fiber is the fiber of this map. And then, um, so this is a fibration over S1. So, so I can look at the, the monodromy map of, around S1 of this fibration. And that's called the Milner monodromy map. So here's a picture, schematic picture. F inverse of zero is given by this curve with a isolated singularity at zero, or, or more generally some higher dimensional thing. But in this picture, it's a curve with an isolated singularity at zero. And then I have um, the, the, a fiber, the Milner fiber is, is um, a subset of a submanifold of 
um, the sphere um, given by uh, the argument of, uh, the, the argument of x, x equal to epsilon or something or some some you know e to the i theta times epsilon or something. And then there's a monodromy map I can go all the way around and consider the the, the monodromy map. So you're, you're thinking of, of MF as equipped with the, uh, the, the restriction of the symplectic form from CM? Yes, 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 yes. And yeah, and, and the monodromy map is some, uh, is the kernel of omega. Right. You just fo follow that flow. Yeah. So yeah, so as I said, the, the Milner monodromy map can be made into an exact symplectomorphism. So, you know, omega is exact in CN, so, so, so right. it's an exact symplectomorphism. And so I can compute FLIR cohomology of iterates of the monodromy map. Um, so if you think about it, the, the chain complex is generated by fixed points of this iterates of this map. And, uh, if you look at the left, so, so if you look at the left shets fixed point formula, you can show that the Euler characteristic of this flow group is the left shets number of, of phi f, or, or phi f to the d. So, so you could think of these flow groups as um, like a, a categorification of the Milner monodromy zeta function, if, if you know what that is. Um, and uh, yeah. The, the sort of morphisms are induced by something called adjacency of singularities. So there is a more, there are morphisms as well. Uh, sorry, when you um, when you compute the Euler characteristic, you have to take a sum over degrees. And here you have the point is that even though in principle you would have, I mean, I haven't told you what the grading is, but the the, the but the point is that the. The the, the, deg the local degree is is the the, the, the um, parity of the grading. Yeah, the, the story of gradings is a little bit complicated, so I don't want to go into that. But you reduce it down to where you only have finite. It's it you're grading with only finitely many. Yeah, you can. I mean, VF has to be generically perturbed so that it has finitely many fixed points, and then you. Um, I see do this calculation, you know, just as a Morse function, you know, if general uh -huh. functions okay. generically yeah, yeah. perturbed into a Morse function. Okay, so here's an example. I think I'm, I, I've got to keep an eye on the time. Okay, so here's an example. X squared plus Y cubed. That's my polynomial. That's my favorite polynomial. Uh, the Milner fiber is a torus with one boundary component. And uh, here's the picture of the Milner fiber. So exercise, this is a torus with one boundary component. Um, the way to understand this is that this is a homogeneous, a weighted homogeneous singularity. So if I multiply X by like Z cubed and Y by Z squared, then F gets multiplied by Z to the six. So it's weighted homogeneous, and using that sort of structure, you can compute what this, what, what the Milner fiber is essentially. And there's a, a nice action on this. There's a Z over two action, which swaps the top and the bottom layers of this surface. And that corresponds to replacing X with minus X. And there's a Z over three Z action uh, corresponding to multiplying Y by cube roots of unity. And so, these two, these two actions generate a z over six action, and phi f is essentially the generator of this action. Modulo some boundary rotation factor, so the, the boundary actually rotates by a sixth, and then you have to unrotate it. So when you actually when you take powers of phi f, you actually get some sort of Dane twist of the boundary eventually, but I, that's a subtlety to just be aware of. Okay, so this is the, the, the example. And then let's look at flow cohomology of the square of the Milner monodromy map. So the square is just the Z3 action, it's the generator of the Z3 action. This has two fixed points. 
they're sort of identical because you have this symmetry, the Z2 symmetry. So they should have the same grading, whatever, however you define grading. And so flood cohomology is Z plus Z. It's in some degree, degree minus three, if you choose the appropriate grading conventions. Okay, so that's an example. And the so differential cathedral group that's acting, you're, you're, when you, the Z2 is actually flipping, so there's a kind of orientation associated with the twist of these. Uh, well, it's Oops. orientation, yes, yeah, so, yeah, it sort of flips this, but it preserves orientation. So the, the, the orientation at the top is going down and the orientation at the bottom is going up, so you flip. I think that's how it works, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's see. Okay. So that's my example. And then, um, uh, yes. Okay, so let's talk about arc spaces for the, the last 10 minutes, and I'll explain the main theorem. So start with the unit disk in C. And then I'm going to define something called the jet space. So the jet space is just the space of holomorphic maps from the disk to CN passing through zero in this case. And it's an equivalence class of holomorphic maps. So I have these equivalence classes of holomorphic maps. And two maps are equivalent if the first D derivatives of those maps agree. And that's the D jet space at zero. Um, there's my little picture of an arc. So an arc is just a holomorphic map and I'm just looking at jets of arcs. So you could think of it as the um, space of n tuples of degree d polynomials as well. So it works. So you can think of it like that. So you know every every such holomorphic map is in the equivalence class of some polynomial. So I can think of it as a space of polynomials. Okay. So now I have my remember I have my polynomial f with an isolated singularity at zero. And the example is like x squared plus y cubed. And um, the, the dth contact locus is a space. And it's, and it's this, the following space. It's the space of d jets equal to u of t. So that when you apply the polynomial to that d jet, you get t to the power of d. So, um, maybe in words rather than a formula. It's the space of D jets that map via F to the D jet of Z goes to Z to the D. And um, again, in the interests of time. Okay, so it has some description in terms of polynomials, which maybe I won't say, um, but you could think of it as the other way of thinking of it is sort of morally, it's if you look at, if you think of D jets of holomorphic maps from D to C, and you look at the boundary of that map, if the boundary of that map sort of wraps around the, the, the zero fiber D times, that's essentially sort of what this D contact locus is. Um, yeah, so probably the best way of thinking about it for the moment is, is this way. You think of it as the subspace of D jets that map to the d-jet of z to the d. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so I could do the example. Um, I don't have time to do, it's probably best not to do a computation here. But, but if you look at the polynomial x squared plus y cubed, then you can uh, compute the, say, the second contact locus, chi two or there. And um, as a topological space, it's just the disjoint union of two copies of C3. If you just work it out, you just plug in the polynomials. 
Um, so, so yeah. So, so these contact loci are are basically sort of holomorphic arcs whose boundary wraps around the, the central fiber D times essentially, and then you only remember the D jets of those arcs. So arc is so 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 that's how to think about it. Okay. Okay, so here's a conjecture um, by these people here. And the conjecture says the following thing. It says the flow cohomology of the D power of the Milner monotony map. This is the Milner monotony map raised to the power of D. This is isomorphic to compactly supported cohomology of the D contact locus, okay? So this is where um, you know maybe algebraic geometers might be can, can, can prove things in symplectic geometry because here you have a flow group which is difficult to define and hard to understand, but this is just compactly supported cohomology of some variety associated with the singularity, and you can compute that. And so you, once you be able, once you compute that, you may be able to prove say results about fixed points of the Milner monodromy map. And yeah, there's some shift in degree, and that's due to the fact that I chose bad grading conventions of flow cohomology and nothing else. Um, yeah, so um, uh, let's see how much time I have left. Okay, so uh, yeah, so maybe I won't explain everything here, but. Um, so the same people, I'll just write BDBLN, they prove this conjecture when D equals M. Um, they, but essentially they didn't use, they, they, these people are algebraic geometers, they're not symplectic geometers. Their paper has no, really no symplectic geometry in it. Um, but they, they use a theorem of mine to, to prove this as a black box, essentially. And, um, okay, I'll, I'll forget about this corollary. Um, so here's my theorem. So this is my theorem. So my theorem is the following. This conjecture is true in general. Okay. So this is in progress. Uh, I hope to do it by the summer, I hope, depending on how busy I am. Um, so, um, yeah, so flow cohomology is a compactly supported cohomology group of some explicit algebraic variety. Might it be clearer, though, to use Poincaré duality to get rid of the compact supports? Uh, this is a singular space. Ah, I see. Yeah, so what, we, what you can do is, you know, because it's a sub variety of some affine space, you could thicken it to a tubular neighborhood, some sort of neighborhood, and then use Poincare duality. Um, but, but, you know, that, that involves extra sort of data. So, so I could have done it that way. Right. Yeah, so again, uh, uh, yeah, so, so this, is, this conjecture is true. Um, so I have five minutes left. I, I should probably, um, I wanna just explain a little bit why, why this is true. Um, although I don't know if I have enough time to explain everything. Oh yeah, we can do this example, but maybe I won't say too much. So in this example, we computed uh, the second contact locus. It was the disjoint union of C3 with C3. It's compactly supported cohomology is Z plus Z in some degree of degree six. And then flow cohomology of the second iterate of phi is also Z plus Z. And hence the conjecture is true. And, and um, the degrees also agree as well once you have this shift that they put in this conjecture. So in this example, it's true. Um, Okay, so the key, one of the main ideas is to construct a morphism 
from flow cohomology to compactly supported cohomology of this space. And this map is called a, it, it, it's, it, it's a sort of, it, it's sort of a, 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 like a P, it's called a PSS map. So, um, uh, Plukin, Salomon and Schwartz. That's the names of the people. Um, and this is a sort of jet version of their map. So it's a little bit enhanced. So it's some map from flow cohomology to compactly supported cohomology. And yeah, the idea is to show this map is an isomorphism. Um, so the first thing to notice is essentially this Milner map is the mapping torus of the F. So um, up to deformation. So here's the picture of this Milner map. And you have this sort of fiber, you take the monotony going around and you glue again via the, you get the mapping torus. So that's the first observation. Um, and then if you look at fixed points of phi f to the power of d, they correspond to multi-sections of this mapping torus. So sections that when you project to S1, they go round d times. Or as I said, it's in the, in the map, the Milner map. So really you're mapping via the argument of f now to S1. And then the PSS map is, is built by counting certain holomorphic planes, which limits to these multi-sections. Um, you know, just as the differential is built using count by counting holomorphic sections of R cross M phi, now I'm counting holomorphic multi-sections of some sort of bundle over a, a disk, over a plane over C. Um, here's a sort of very rough picture. Um, so what you do is you look at the space, the ball bounded with boundary S epsilon, you look at B epsilon, and you think of that, you look at just the interior of the ball and you choose some, you identify that with CN, so you take CN and you squash it into the ball and you push forward the complex structure and you get some sort of asymptotically cylindrical sort of complex structure in the interior of this ball. And then you look at holomorphic sections of F. You look at F restricted to this ball and you look at holomorphic sections of F that limit to these multi-sections. So this green circle here sort of represents, say, a multi, uh, say a, a multi-section corresponding to a fixed point. And then you look at sort of holomorphic planes that go through zero and limit to these multi-sections. Uh, okay, uh, and then what you do is you just, uh, I'll stop here. So what you do is you just take the dejet of that multi-section and that gives you somehow, it, that induces a map between flow cohomology, that, that's, that induces a map between flow cohomology and this, this contact locus, this jet, this jet space. Um, so the point is I have this multi-section and I look at the moduli space, this moduli space of these holomorphic dips planes, you know, that's some space that sort of planes, and you know, you have a family of planes like moving about. Then you take the d jets of each of those planes that sweeps out a sort of cycle, a sort of locally finite like cycle, um, which you could pretend is the Poincare dual of the compactly supported cohomology class. Um, or, or as I, as, as I said with Claude Lebrun, you take this singular space thick and it's like the, and you look at this cycle sweep swept out in this, this manifold and that and use Poincare duality. So yeah, so, so it's 5.30, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Do, do you think you can do this? Um, I mean, um, that this formalism could work if, if you were working over periodic numbers or 
even though there are a lot of complex arguments, but do you think? Um, I, I remember, I, I don't know. My answer is I don't know. I do re vaguely remember some sort of like some number theorists like Min Yong Kim trying to do some sort of flirt, piadic style kind of flirt theory or something. And I have no idea like what was rigorous, what was not, how easy or hard this is. I, it sounded stupendously hard, but I, I just, you know, I, I don't really understand what they're doing at all. Um, Thank you. Do these, uh, so the, the, there's a big role of, of multi-sections in the story. Uh, if you have uh, fixed points of, of iterates, I guess you, you would get uh, a contribution there, but can you easily separate out what, what, when you look at iterates of the map and you have fixed points of it, then uh, you would get associated multi-sections. But presumably most are not of that form. Is that easy to understand? Well, oh, okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, I, yeah, I'm sweeping lots of details under the rug. But, but one thing is that really what I'm doing is instead of taking multi-sections, I'm taking, I, I take the default covering map of S1 Mm -hmm. And I pull back this vibration to that default cover, right. and and I my holomorphic. Then I look at sections of that that mapping torus, which is a mapping torus. The pullback is a mapping torus of phi to the d. Right. And I'm looking at sections of that, and and this holomorphic plane near infinity has a lift. To, I, I choose a lift. To, to, to this pullback and I, I want it to limit to this section rather than a multi-section. So, so really I'm looking at sections. Um, uh, yeah. Um. But you could, in addition to having uh, fixed points of, of, of iterates of the map, you would also have things that were just unions of a certain number of of fixed points, right? So some right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so you could do, um, uh, you know, what embedded contact homology is. You've done cyborg with you know, monopole flirt, and there's embedded contact homology. You could try and do this in the world of embedded contact homology and ask what what is it in terms of the arc space? And that's a good question. Um, Simon Donaldson asked me that question, and uh, it's a good project for. It's a very good project. Um. Shall we uh, do the traditional form of clapping rather than just icons? <laughs> do both. <laughs>